man phoning to inquire about hotel information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. You're through to reception at the Island Hotel in Crete. How may I help you today? Yes, hello there. I'm hoping to book a double room for my wife and myself for about two weeks from the 25th of April of this year. Firstly. Could you tell me whether it's particularly hot during this time? Yes, of course, sir. During late April and early May, the daytime temperature shouldn't exceed 19 degrees Celsius. But the weather has been rather erratic and difficult to predict in recent years, so I am unable to say for certain. OK, that sounds good. My wife doesn't like going outside when it's very hot. I haven't booked flights yet but I must say that I'm unfamiliar with Crete and its transport system. Does the hotel provide an airport shuttle service? Yes, sir. We provide a complimentary airport pickup service for all our guests. It takes about 40 minutes to get here from the airport, but it's at least 60 minutes at rush hours, and you will be provided with a fully air-conditioned shuttle bus. OK, excellent. In that case, do you have any rooms available for the dates I gave you? I shall have a look on the system now for you, sir. Bear with me just a moment. Yes, sir. I can see now that we have several rooms available. Would you prefer a garden view or a sea view? Well, ideally, I would like a sea view room with a balcony. But of course, that depends on the difference in price. Not to worry, sir. All of our standard double rooms have ensuite facilities and a balcony. If you would like one of our sea view rooms, there is a premium of 60 euros per night. OK. So could you tell me the total nightly rate for a standard double room with a sea view? Yes, of course, sir. For the spring months, our rate is 216 euros per night. For 14 nights altogether, this will come to 3,024 euros. Perfect. I also read on your website that the hotel has gym and spa facilities. Are there any other facilities on offer? Yes, we have a large outdoor infinity pool overlooking the ocean with luxury sunbeds and a poolside bar. We also have three full-size tennis courts where we run a popular doubles tournament with the winner receiving two all-inclusive spa day vouchers. Goodness, I shall have to brush up on my tennis skills. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Are there any other activities organised by the hotel that we can partake in? It's just that it's our wedding anniversary on the 30th of June, and I would like to provide my wife with a perfect romantic getaway. I can assure you, sir, that your wife won't be disappointed. Ours is a five-star resort, which is renowned for its luxury and beauty. In terms of activities, the hotel provides thrice-weekly entertainment. On Tuesdays, Guests will take a minibus and partake in learning to cook succulent fish dishes with our Michelin-starred chef, Enrique. The class will take place in a beautiful valley deep in the Cretan Hills, where guests will be treated to an intimate piano performance by our in-house concert pianist, Pedro. On Wednesdays, a select number of guests will be fortunate enough to explore the mountains by helicopter. 
before being transported to a tropical Cretan garden by shuttle bus. Finally, on Thursdays, after a fancy dinner, we provide a spectacular fireworks display, which guests can view from the comfort of a cable car. Oh, wow! That all sounds absolutely wonderful. I shall book the room now, and then I need to look at flights so as not to become extortionate. Would you like to take my details now or later? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a man talking about living and working on Trinidad. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation, I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there, but some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example, which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival, when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. For a whole month, around February or March, it depends when Easter is, Everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of 24-hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people joined bands, each one of which has a theme. For example, the sea or jungle fever, and they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost $1,000 for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone full of colour and sound. It's serious, too. The bands are in competition, and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called St. Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, St. Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. <laughs> I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. Every time I arrived at the gate, kids would come running towards me, shouting, with big smiles on their faces. The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to 11-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you? More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions, and so many different kinds of festival to see. Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians, too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a professor and a student talking about taking a course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Excuse me, Dr. Twain. May I speak with you for a minute? 
Of course, please come in. I'm Charlotte York. I'm considering taking your course in tourism. Right. Well, Charlotte, how can I help you? I have been considering studying tourism. However, it is such an important decision that I would like to seek some advice about it first. Would you mind answering some of my questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Well, I have been discussing courses with my parents, and they are concerned that I will not be able to get a well-paid job with a degree in tourism. The reason that I want to study the course is that I have a great interest in the subject, and I think I would really enjoy it. I believe the only way that I will enjoy my life is if I enjoy my career. Happiness is far more important than money, don't you think? Absolutely. I would much rather be happy and poor rather than rich and miserable. Money cannot buy you happiness. I'm glad you agree. You needn't worry about money, Charlotte. A large part of the tourism course is dedicated to teaching students how to manage finances, a skill that you can apply to your everyday life as well. I would also recommend that you take a sideline course in time management, as this can be incredibly useful in efficiently planning your workload. Efficiency is the key to success. I'll remember that. Now I have found that some students have natural talents that really help them to succeed in the course. Communication skills, for example, can be very beneficial. Do you have any strengths? Maths was always my favourite subject at school, so I really enjoy solving mathematical problems. However, I find statistics quite difficult. I have always been very capable and self-sufficient. I have a lot of confidence in my abilities and will take the initiative in situations without needing to depend on anyone else for their help. That's a really great quality to have, and will be particularly useful if you choose to study tourism. That's great. I would recommend that you spend some of your time researching the course. A lot of people who are uneducated on the subject claim that tourism is a shrinking industry, and that it will become irrelevant in the future. If you study the published research, however, you will see that the truth is quite the opposite. The industry has, in fact, grown significantly as people have developed an ever-increasing interest in culture and travel. Have you compared the university course with a polytechnic? Yes, I have. I was interested in studying the course in modules. However, the university doesn't offer that option. I don't have enough funds to be able to attend an expensive university. So I was relieved to see that the course is quite affordable. I also considered attending a summer school instead of university to save money, and so that I could work during the rest of the year. But I really wanted the university experience. I think that university would suit you well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Now, what about the courses? Are you interested in any of the other subjects on offer? I have looked at a few. I was interested in travel and business, as it sounds similar to tourism. That is really worth learning. However, be aware that it is difficult and will demand a lot of your time. Okay, that's good to know. You might find that Japanese is an interesting course, and it will teach you valuable skills in speaking the language. Personally, it's not bad and could be of some help, but not that much. Okay, Japanese, got that. What about medical care? Well, if you have time, the course will teach you a lot about curing diseases and illnesses or dealing with injuries outside, although it's not essential. So okay, if it's useful, I'll take it. 
If you enjoy using technology and are worried about fulfilling the entry requirements, computing is very relaxed about the skills that applicants must possess. I'm terrible with computers, so I'm not sure that I would enjoy that course. How about public relations? Yes, I would recommend that course. It would be related to entering the tourism industry, as it will educate you on how to approach clients and develop associations with them. That's great. Thank you so much for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about how adults and babies communicate. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hi, I'm Emma Bailey, and today I'm going to be talking baby talk. Hopefully, you'll find the subject interesting rather than infantile. I'd like to start by getting you to imagine a scenario: you're in an office or at a family gathering when a mother comes in with her young baby. Like everyone else. You want to see the mother and baby, and you probably want to talk to the baby. How do you do this? What kind of language do you use? Recent research has shown that adults all talk to babies in similar ways. They repeat phrases over and over again in a high-pitched sing-song voice with long vowel sounds, and if they ask questions, they exaggerate their intonation. Researchers have discovered that this kind of language. Which they have called motherese, is used by adults all over the world when they talk to babies, and according to a new theory, motherese forms a kind of framework for the development of language in children. This baby talk, so the theory goes, itself originated as a response to another aspect of human evolution, walking upright. In contrast to other primates, humans give birth to babies that are relatively undeveloped. So, whereas a baby chimpanzee can hold on to its four-legged mother and ride along on her back shortly after birth, helpless human babies have to be held and carried everywhere by their upright mothers. Having to hold on to an infant constantly would have made it more difficult for the mother to gather food. In this situation, researchers suggest human mothers began putting their babies down beside them while gathering food. To pacify an infant distressed by this separation, the mother would talk to her offspring and continue her search for food. This remote communication system could have marked the start of motherese, as mothers increasingly relied on their voices to control the emotions of their babies and later the actions of their mobile juveniles. Words emerged from the jumble of sounds. And became conventionalized across human communities, ultimately producing language.
Not all anthropologists, however, accept the assumption that early human mothers put their children down when they were looking for food. They point out that even modern parents do not do this. Instead, they prefer to hold their babies in their arms or carry them around in slings. They suggest that early mothers probably made slings of some kind, both for ease of transportation and to keep their babies warm by holding them close to their bodies. If this was the case, they would not have needed to develop a way of comforting or controlling their babies from a distance. It's not only anthropologists, but also linguists who challenge this explanation for how language developed. They say that although the mother ease theory may account for the development of speech, it does not explain the development of grammar. Nor, they say, does it explain how the sounds that mothers made acquired their meaning. Most experts believe that language is a relatively modern invention that appeared in the last 100,000 years or so. But if the latest theory is right, baby talk, and perhaps fully evolved language, was spoken much earlier than that. We know that humans were walking upright one and a half million years ago. This means that mothers may have been putting their babies down at this time and communicating with them in mother ease. We can be sure that this is not the end of the story, as anthropologists and linguists will continue to investigate the origins of this most human of abilities, language. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Welcome to our channel. Today in this video, I'll discuss with you writing task 1 and the question for today is The charts give information about employment in the UK in 1998 and 2012. Summarize the information by selecting and reporting the main features and make comparisons where relevant. So we are given this graph which is representing the employment in the UK. So as we can see, men were highly enrolled in the full-time work like 53% in the year 1998 as the ratio decreased but a highly huge number of men were enrolled in full-time work like from 53 to 47% and women uh, if we compare women were highly enrolled in the part-time jobs like 22% and 20% women were enrolled in both the years respectively and only 6% and 7% of men were enrolled in part-time jobs in the year 1988 and 2012. So if we see the numbers as well, 12,539 men were you know enrolled in full-time work in the year 1988 and the number increased roughly by 1,000 we can say and uh, 400 sorry 4482 men were enrolled sorry women were enrolled in full time which increased by 3000 and uh, if we talk about men in the part time jobs in numbers were 1550 thousands because the numbers are given in thousands and this also increased to 2131 Lastly, uh, the women who were with the part-time jobs were 5,268,000 5 in the year 1988 and increased to 5,979. So, a minimal increase can be seen here, right? So, let's see how we can write this now. So, the rendered pie charts means the given pie charts depict the information about the ratio and the total number of males and females in thousands working in the UK in 1998 sorry it's 1988 it has to be 1988 here also 1988 and 2012 overall it is discernible from the graph means it is clear from the graph that men were primarily employed in full-time work than women while women were mostly working in part-time jobs okay now explicitly the number of workers surged from 
23,839 to 29,600,000 after 24 years. So we can see a total number of people or male and female were employed like 20,839 which increased to 29,600 after 24 years. Although 12,539 uh, men it's not when men were working full time in 1988 which increased to 13,794 so we are just writing the numbers like from 12,539 to 13,794 however the ratio of full time men workers plunged by 6% in 2012 as compared to 53% in 1990 sorry in 1988 so we can see like 53% were enrolled in a full-time work in 1988 and this dec decreased to 47% that's why we are writing that plunged by 6% in the year 2012. On the other hand percentage of full-time working women climbed from 19% in 1988 to slightly over a quarter in 2012. So as you can see the ratio for full-time women uh, full-time working women was 19% in 1988 and which increased to slightly over a quarter like from 25% like one quarter is 25% and it is 26% that's why we can write it slightly over a quarter and the number also sold from 4482 to 7696 like 4482 to 7696 now if we talk about the part time work turning to part time work 1550 males were enrolled in 1988 1550 men were enrolled in the year 1988 and the number grew to 2131 in 2012 and the percentile increased negligibly by 1% from 6% in 1988 so the ratio was just 6% in the year 1988 and it incre increased just barely by 1%. That's why we are saying that negligibly by 1%. The count of women was 5,268 in 1988, which sowed or increased minimally to 5,979. And the proportion dropped from 22% to 1 fifth. And the ratio dropped from 22% to 20%. That's why we are writing 1 fifth. Okay, because 1 fifth is. 20%. So this was for today. If you like the video, do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. I'll meet you in the next video. Till then, bye bye and take care.